Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Good morning. Uh, today is a second lecture on the EME442 Biomechanics. It's a lecture on orthosis. The second part is where we will cover some of the, uh, or one of the first uh, orthosis that has been documented and will provide uh, a good uh, piece of study for us to understand uh, the basics from which we will form our understanding for us to use in analysis of a more uh, complicated structure. So it will be covering on Rex. So what is Rex? Uh, Rex is uh, the acronym for Wilmington Robotic uh, Exo Exoskeleton. We have discussed about exoskeleton in the first lecture. And this is uh, Rex is one of ex one example of robotic exoskeleton. Oh. So the Wilmington robotic exoskeleton or Rex is a passively uh, is a passively gravity balanced arm orthosis uh, that was developed at the numerous Alfred Dupont Hospital for children in Wilmington, Delaware. This is in the US. Uh, it is designed for people suffering from neuromuscular weakness or muscle weaknesses of the upper limbs by assisting in elevating the upper limbs and improving range of motion uh, by eliminating the effects of gravity. Uh, this is typically for patients with arthrogryposis. So there are big uh, words here, for example, like uh, neuromuscular, passively gravity balance. Uh, we've covered the word orthosis. And then we've got this uh, disease called arthrogryposis. So arthrogryposis is a term used, uh, or also known as arthrogryposis multiplex congenita, or AMC refers to a group of non-progressive conditions, non-progressive, it doesn't uh, get worse with time, characterized by multiple joint contractures found throughout the body at birth. So congenital, congenital is at birth. So the, de the designation is currently used in connection with a very heterogeneous series of disorders that all include the common features of multiple congenital joint contractures. And you can refer this in PubMed. So the joints are not that normal, so we have limited range of motion, very stiff muscles, and the muscles are weak. So they cannot perform most of the tasks associated uh, with the use of that particular joint and muscles. So is arthro Gryposis. So this is a typical uh, baby with atrogryposis. Uh, you look at the features. The mind is normal. Okay. The face sometimes is long and the jaw is relatively large. Shoulders sometimes turn in. Uh, wrists are often bent up or out stiffly. So there's a stiff joint here. Often the arms are stiff at elbows and also weak. So the muscle is not properly developed and it's also weak. Hands and fingers are often very weak. So they cannot uh, move their fingers and hands that well. So manipulating finger foods or utensils like spoons and forks and also pencils and pens are difficult for uh, people or children with arthrogryposis. The spine itself is often curved, uh, but the trunk strength is usually normal. So, trunk strength means they can stand on their own. Uh, look at this wonderful boy. Even though the spine is curved, but he can walk and stand on his own. Uh, hips are often bent upward or outward stiffly, quite stiff hips and may be dislocated. Uh, contractures are where with webbing 
or scheme behind joints. Yeah, dia punya joint bercantum, ada web. Uh, so it's like the knees, at hips, elbows, or sometimes at shoulders. Uh, the knees sometimes bent or maybe straight, and also in a stiff position. Club foot is also quite common with baby uh, which has outro gryposis. So uh, the wonderful boy here has a lot of features that has been described as what is uh, the features of, of baby with outro gryposis. So a bit of definitions in order to help us to properly understand what is being talked about. Congenital is of a disease or physical abnormality present from birth. So when you had it the day at birth, so we call it the congenital. Contractures. Contractures are a decrease in passive range of motion, ROM, range of motion, at a joint. Okay, so passive means that nobody is assisting that person to move their hand. For example, like I'm showing my hands here, like how far, how far I can move my hands in and out. So how far I can move it in and out. It's a passive range of motion. Uh, it may be the result of loss of length in muscles, okay, or periarticular connective tissues. Okay. Sometimes the tissues are connected, uh, cartilage, capsule, and ligament with increased stiffness in these structures. So there's, uh, so it's limited range of motion because of the connecting of the tissues. In terms of epidemiology or prevalence, how much, how often is this case in the society? It is a, a rare condition. Yeah, it is stated here one in three thousand. But among European is about more 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 like one in eleven thousand to twelve thousand. I don't have the data for for Malaysia. So this is an example of a Rex exoskeleton as attached to the wheelchair. So it's an exoskeleton, but not connected to the body, but attached to the wheelchair. All right. We'll come back to this figure. But when you say Rex, it is this kind of exoskeleton. Okay, here is the shows how we can connect it to the wheelchair, and the blue color here is the rubber. So, so also the case in the left uh, figure. This is the rubber, and this is also the rubber. And you can see there are several holes that is uh, located. On the exoskeleton, where you can change the uh, distance between these two uh, connecting points, so that you can uh, 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 increase the extension of the rubber band. Similarly here, but and there are two joints at the shoulder, and also one joint at the knee. So at the shoulder, you've got a pin joint here. This is a pin joint here, and you can move the upper arm up and down. Okay. At the same time, there is a rotating joint about the vertical axis. This is a pin, so it can rotate about the vertical axis. So you have got two degree of freedom here. Similarly, this is for the support of the elbow. Okay, and the elbow is holding the uh, lower arm or lower hand, or lower arm, upper arm, lower arm. And this is the support for the lower arm, and it can uh, rotate about the vertical axis. So it's a vertical uh, rotational joint here, and at the same time, it has it can also rotate about the elbow axis. So it can do what we call flexion and extension. And this one is uh, there's two degrees of freedom at the elbow, and two degrees of freedom at the shoulder joint. So you can look at this figure two where there is the degree of freedom for the elbow and this is the degree of freedom for the 
So it's a different sets of design. Yeah. Look similar. Some there are similarity and there's so differences, and you can adjust according to the uh, requirement and the size of the uh, patient. Okay. Remember in the first lecture the principle of of fit and adjust. So here is the case for the Rex exoskeleton. So, uh, or more simply, this is a diagram that shows where A, the two degrees of freedom at these joints. Yeah. So you got the rotational about the vertical axis and rotational about the horizontal axis or the axis out of the paper. So this is for uh, up and down movement of the upper arm and this is up and down movement for the lower arm and you can still rotate both uh, arms about the vertical axis. So it was deemed that uh, this kind of degree of freedom is uh, enough for them to carry out some of the duty, uh, perhaps to move their hands to their face or to pick up certain things. Remember students, uh, you know, children with ag uh, agrophoresis, are also they also have weak uh, fingers, but this, in this case the hands and the fingers are in a way are not, are not supported. So only the uh, joints for the elbow and joints for the shoulder is supported. So they support the, the weight. So, uh, and there is this rubber band here. Okay. And you can move this rubber band to a different point along here. And also you can move it back here in order to increase or decrease the extension of the rubber. So the device is a lightweight exoskeleton structure that is arranged parallel to the arm okay, and fixed to either a wheelchair or a back brace for stability. Stability uh, in biomedical term is always uh, related to the uh, to the features of mo not being easily moved. Okay, So when you say stability, you want it to be uh, not easily moved. So there is an anchor point or you want it to be fixed. And the racks consists of two segments. Yeah, So an upper arm link constructed from hollow steel or 3D printed plastic, so I will, rods into the shape of a parallelogram. Okay. And then there is a forearm link that is a single rod. And you've seen the forearm link which support the, the lower arm. And then there is the linear elastic bands as a linkage between two segments, which provide a balance and a shift movements against the effect of the gravity. I've shown you the, the linear, the rubber bands. Yeah. And these are that provide the stiffness or the, the, the restoring forces to uh, compensate for the weight of the system and also the weight of the limbs. So here is uh, how the gravity compensation work. The gravity is compensated by two sets of rubber bands that are arranged to oppose gravity effects downwards so these two sets of rubber bands, this is for the elbow and this is for the lower arm. The rubber bands are selected by clinicians and doctors and adjusted to provide enough lift to eliminate effects of gravity. Yeah? So that you feel that it's very light or almost uh, that the arm is somewhat supported. Okay? But not so much that it overpowers the various limited uh, muscular strength. Okay? So there is this parallelogram for the upper arm and for the lower arm there is no parallelogram just a simple beam cantilever beam supported by a spring here or elastic band here so this parallelogram allows you to move and maintain uh, this if you study dynamics you understand that this parallelogram allows you when you move up this axis will always remain parallel to the shoulder axis okay so so that there is no uh, it will not uh, turn or whatever so so you allow some control of the movement so it's quite a stable way of achieving parallel um, motion uh, of this particular axis with the shoulder so there is a benefit of studying uh, dynamics there in explaining the effect of parallelogram so that's gravity compensation we'll do the the mathematics uh, in the third lecture or the fourth one 
So let's see. Uh, this is a paper by uh, way in two thousand seven when the article was first uh, published, and we want to study how this affect the patients. So this is a clinical study. Uh, with this kind of clinical study, uh, there are certain discipline to it. It's a way of proving that the, the design uh, work or what is the efficacy of the design. How effective is the design? So this is paper is published and I was published in IEEE Transactions on Neural System and Rehabilitation Engineering back in 2007. Uh, the authors are Tariq Rahman and there are many more. And the title of the paper is Design and Testing of a Functional Arm Orthosis in Patients with Neuromuscular Diseases. So I will take certain parts of the papers for the point of discussion in this lecture. The Rex exoskeleton arm has shown promise in assisting patients. So that was the claim. 17 subjects or patients ages between 4 till 20 years old suffering from muscular dystrophy okay the muscular becoming weaker the muscle become weaker were tested with the device okay so we are gonna read this uh, paper so how do we measure the effectiveness of the autosis so clinical studies report just just like uh, previous slides are uh, required uh, to prove the effectiveness of the autosis. In this case, effectiveness is measured using time taken to complete the task. So, uh, there is the scope of how he claimed that his device was effective. They are using a Jepson test. So, when they are using time taken, so the faster, uh, the shorter the time taken to complete the task, uh, the better the performance so the lower the better so reporting is in the word in is in mean value plus minus standard deviation so when you read the article you are looking at how they are measuring the effectiveness of the paper or of the uh, autosis now the experimental procedure so we will look at how they carry out uh, the experiment so they have to list the protocol or the methodology here so after a patient agreed to participate and meet the inclusion criteria his or her arm was cast to obtain a custom forearm brace so the one that is supporting the forearm or the lower arm would be a custom brace the casting was performed at the hospital prosthetics and orthotics facility the brace was then attached to the rex the patient returned to the laboratory and the rex was attached to the wheelchair the upper arm link was adjusted in length to match the anatomical limb the number of bands was adjusted the number of rubber bands was adjusted so there was just enough lift for each patient this adjustment allowed the patient to move the arm freely in a 3d space the rex was fixed to the wheelchair by positioning the first joint above the shoulder this provided optimal movement of the arm a hollow length of steel tubing was then bent between the racks and a wheelchair clamp. This provided a robust and precise connection. Four racks units were constructed and rotated between the 70 patients in the study. So look at some of the words that is used here so that we can learn something from the experimental procedure the first one is the patient agreement see this is called patient consent so you must give them the patient must give consent to participate this is part of the 
whole ethical process. Okay. So you need to have consent. Because they are children, you must have their parent agreement for them to participate. In order for you to give them consent, you must use you must educate them and tell them all the risks and what you're going to do with in the in the in the experiment. So it is called an informed consent. Informed consent. The next thing is the inclusion criteria. So these are the criteria that you want your study to be made. For example, uh, in this case, depends on what is your, it can be, you don't want person to be overweight, for example, so you said that the BMI must be less than 30, whatever. This is just, for example, this is example, yeah? Or you want the person to be able to understand or uh, able to communicate. So those who are unable to communicate will be excluded from the, and so on. So you can put criteria there. Okay. And then the numbers of samples, numbers of patients involved. There are 17 patients involved. So, so here, the number of patients or samples is N equals 17. And what, how many uh, samples were made for this study? They only made four. So they made four and this was rotated. Okay, so four, four was made and it was rotated between these. So it takes some uh, a longer time. So uh, this somewhat cover uh, some of the points or informations that you need for your um, clinical study involving humans. You need to have all these things. You need to have patient consent. You need to have the inclusion criteria. You need to specify what is your number of study. And from there, uh, you need to also say what are the things that you're going to do in the study. So this is a picture where the patient is prepared for the Jepson test. Okay, so this is again, this is a test, Jepson test. We'll go back to this. And this is uh, has to be shown to the ethical committee in your application forms that you are going to carry out this kind of experiment. Yeah, so the students are seated or the patient is seated and this is how uh, there is a bent rod and this is how you connect to the wheelchair and so on. Yeah, so this and most of the time you see photos of the patients involved, the face will be black out. This is to remove the identity of the uh, patient or the identity of the subjects involved. Unless they give consent uh, uh, and they would like to have their face involved uh, and this has got to be expressed in the illustrations. Most of the time we will black out the face. So what is Jepson test? Okay, So we look into what Jepson test is. For the first round of testing, patients completed the Jepson test of hand function. So it's a Jepson test of hand function without the regs. So there is a comparison here. You have the regs, you have the without the regs. Sorry. To, to. And after they're used in their home for two weeks, they retook the Jepson test with the regs. So, and second test is you have the test with the regs. So the Jepson test evaluated each individual disability. Before that, I just want to add the point here that is for comparison. Comparison basis, yeah. Before and after. So before and after, you know, this is commonly done in many experiments. Okay. So the Jepson test was evaluated for each individual disability. Uh, so it, they, they evaluate individual, individual disability as well as the effectiveness of the treatment. Okay. So this test was created to evaluate, evaluate broad aspects of hand function used in daily living activities 
and provides unbiased measurement of several standardized tasks. So standard, standardized task is always uh, a good way of comparing because if there are similar studies being done elsewhere, for example, done in Japan or Hong Kong or in Malaysia, we can compare the performance at different sites. So this is called multi-site testing. And against which each patient's results can be compared. So now, because of this standardized test, we can compare the performance of each patient and how each patient respond to the, uh, to the treatment or to the intervention, we call it intervention. So the test includes seven sub-tests, seven sub-tests, each represents a different daily living activities. Uh, they are as follows, and we look at the seven sub-tests. So the first one is writing a six to eight word sentence. So for example, we ask them to write the word apple. So they can write the word A-P-P. Apple, yeah, and then uh, is to turn over five pieces of cards. You put down, and they have to turn or flip over the cards, which shows how you can uh, manipulate your hand and fingers. Number three is manipulating small common objects such as paper clips and bottle caps. Clip bottle caps, whether you can handle them. Uh, and put them somewhere or arrange them in a certain manner. Number four is simulated feeding. You can ask the patient to hold a spoon and practicing feeding, um, taking food from a plate into the mouth. Number five is stacking checkers. You ask them to stack things. This is also motor control. Number six is lifting large. Yeah, so you don't need your fingers that much. Light object, for example, empty cans. And number seven is lifting large, heavy, heavy objects. So you give them cans, fill, fill up with things, 500 gram cans. This is big can, half a kilo cans. Yeah. So the test was administered in the same manner to each patient. So we have to describe how the test was carried out. The patients were seated in a chair with a height of 18 inches or 48 centimeter at a desk that was 30 inch or 76 centimeter high. To accommodate, accommodate children with wheelchairs of different heights, a variable height table was designed. And they measure the times of each task measured using a stopwatch. So all this process, how long does it take for them to write apple? Or how long does it take to do all these things? They are measured in stopwatch. It doesn't mention here how whether it was repeated uh, how many times. Maybe it's just a single, single times. So uh, there's no repeating of the test. So uh, we have to assume that because there's not mentioned that uh, whether each each exercise was repeated two times or three times or whatever. So this is the Japset test for the hand. So once the patients completed the first round of Jetson testing, they were fitted with the RECs and given basic instructions for its operation. They used the RECs for approximately one hour under supervision of the research staff and their parent or caregiver. So after the testing, yeah? so this is done after the first round of testing. So, so after the first round. So once they were comfortable with the operation, yeah, they took the racks home for a two-week period. So let's assume they are using it in the house. And during these two weeks, they were asked to use it as much as possible. They could take it to school or elsewhere and were free to use it as they wished. Upon the patient's return, i.e. returned back to the hospital, the Jepson test was retaken with the racks. So we need to highlight that. So now we carry out the test with the racks. And the test times were again recorded. Patients also were provided with a questionnaire regarding their experience with racks to obtain subjective input. So sometimes you have subjective input. We want to show how they understand the problem. So these are the questionnaires. Uh, these are so eight questionnaires, uh, you can read them. 
you can ask them, is the orthosis perform well? What would you change about the orthosis? How much did you use the device daily? Did you like the way it looked? If not, why? What tasks did the device help you do? What tasks did it not help you do that you would have liked? Okay. Would you like to have such a device? And did the device make you tired? This is basically some things that we cannot measure using the Jepson test. Whether a person liked the solution and whether you would like what other tasks that you wanted them to perform and so on. So this is a very good input to your design. So this is what we can do to improve our design. So let us let us look at the patient data. Our patient data is important. So whenever you carry out clinical trial, you need to present to them your uh, patient data. So what are the data? They have patient numbers. You don't know what the identity of the patient. This is important for privacy. And then you know their age, their gender, their weights, and if there is any diseases associated with it. And then their manual muscle test strength. What is their grip, deltoid, and bicep strength? Uh, there are instruments that can be used to measure this. Okay, we'll read a few uh, the data for one or two patients so that we understand uh, what is being listed here. Patient number one. Patient number one is 16 years, male, and weighs about 80 kg. Yeah, so he's quite big and it has a disease of SMA and here it is said that it has a spinal muscular atrophy. So there's something uh, of uh, deficiencies at the spine and the muscle at the back and the MMT strength is there's no grip, there's no strength in the grip and deltoid and there is some sort of strength in the bicep 3 to 3 minus okay let's look at patient number 3 patient number 3 is 11 years old male as heavy as the patient at number 1 almost it's at 79 kg the disease is DMD DMD is Duchenne muscular dystrophy so we need to do some research what is Duchenne muscular dystrophy but it has a strength of 5 for the grip and the deltoid has got a 3 and the bicep has got a strength of 4 so this is quite a strong person person number 3 okay Com in comparison person number 1 is very very weak so you've got all these uh, 70 patients uh, the youngest is four years old the eldest is 20 years old the lightest is the thinnest is 13 year 13, 13 kg the heaviest is 82 kg this guy 12 years old and the strongest deltoid uh, the grip strength is number three five and the bicep strength is four so this is not a standardized test where you can compare the mean value or something like that. So, so each person would have would have responded uh, differently to the intervention when using Rex. So we understand that now the population is not uniform, yeah, and there's more male than female. Uh, most of them are you know above 60 kg. Some of them are lightweight, and there are some diseases that they have, and the variation of strength. So let's see how they responded to the uh, Rex. So this is the result in table 3 is the average task completion time. Uh, when you said about average task completion time is the time taken to complete the task where the lower the, is the better. I mean the smaller number is better. So look at table 3. So we got one, two, uh, got seven uh, tasks from writing, turning cards, small objects, feeding, until lifting of heavy objects so number of subjects not all the tasks can be carried out by the subjects. some subjects have no strength at all for example in lifting heavy objects only five can complete the task out of 70 
When asked to write, only 9 can write. When turning cards, 11 can turn cards. Feeding, most of them have difficulty of feeding when without racks. Yeah? So, you cannot have all 17 here. So, when they use racks, for writing, 9 of them still maintain. But there is, for turning cards, 2 of them found, extra 2 of them. Now, the number of patients can turn the cards are 13. Increase by two small objects. They can manipulate the uh, paper clips and bottle caps. Twelve feeding. Another four can do feeding. Stacking another two uh, light objects. Two more can live and heavy objects. One more can live. So the completion time, uh, for example, for writing from 90 seconds, it takes longer. It takes longer, which is like the Rex is not. Uh, giving positive impacts in terms of writing. For turning cards also, it takes longer, 11.4 seconds to 12.9 seconds. For small objects, manipulating of small objects, it now takes much faster, shorter time, 16.2 seconds in comparison with 21.8 seconds. For feeding, also improve. For stacking, it's also improved. For light, lifting light objects, there is some improvement here. And definitely for heavy objects, it gives much improvement from 21 seconds, reduces to 15.5 seconds. So this, time, this part, measuring how fast, uh, how better in terms of the performance carried out in terms of how long it takes, whether the time can be shortened. And here, like how many more can do a bit more, uh, how many more person or subjects can uh, 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 do more tasks when using racks. Yeah. So they presented the results in terms of percentage uh, tasks completed. So positive means it takes longer time. Negative means it takes shorter time. So here the negative means that the racks is effective in reducing the time needed to carry out the task. For, so let's look at each uh, task. For writing and turning cards, Rex requires longer time. But small objects, lifting small objects, feeding, stacking checkers, lifting light objects, and lifting heavy objects, Rex have positively impacting um, the time. The time taken are shorter. So that's how uh, you read the results. So, discussion. Uh, task 1 of the Jepson test, uh, writing was actually worse with the Rex. This is what we've said, because the hands hovered over the table. So, this is part where they explain, this is how you explain why it is slow, which made precise control of writing difficult. Okay? Uh, they never mention the quality of writing. Yeah? Whether there is the the uh, the quality of writing improve, for example, like if I were to write A B previously like this, and suddenly after I use Rex, my A looks like that. So there is how do you how do you quantify this? How do you quantify this? Yeah. So that's another issue uh, altogether. So task number two, flipping cards over required the ability to pronate and supinate, which the Rex did not provide. Other tasks such as the simulated feeding also required a good degree of supination and pronation which a lot of subjects did not have. So, suddenly this uh, project highlighted the importance of having supination and pronation where we need to look at the simulated feeding. And feeding is an important uh, part of activity of daily life. So, therefore, some of the time suffered due to the absence of this movement. So, he said that Tariq and, her, and, and the guys writing this paper said that a supination and pronation provision is currently being investigated for the Rex. This was way, way back in 2007. Yeah? And I have been following these guys. After that, no more papers coming up. Okay? So, who will take this and improve it? Okay, this is 
a way to improve because whether uh, this is an intervention found for uh, patients with agrofirosis, uh, we have to uh, carry out more study. But here is a case that uh, I think is clear for us from reviewing the results and the design that it clearly have an impact to the patients. Yeah, but we haven't uh, heard whether it was adapted later on or not. This is the commercialization of the Rex. Uh, you can find uh, uh, in Amazon.com under Jayco Rex supports or Rex supports. Uh, forearm support. This is a large size. You can see this is the aluminum tube. You can do adjustment of the height. You can also adjust how far it goes out. This is for the elbow axis. This is for the shoulder axis. Uh, this is for shoulder axis and this one is for the elbow axis. And this is for the forearm and this is for the uh, upper arm. So uh, look at this and uh, why didn't it improve after we discovered that there is no provision for pronation supination? And as a mechanical engineering student, uh, you should think whether you can improve it further and whether there is an economic opportunity for you to create a commercial solution so that you can help uh, these patients to have a better quality of life. I hope you can uh, you have benefited from this lecture. Uh, so. We'll see you in, in the next lecture. Thank you very much.